There's a race happening right now to take over outer space in the 21st century. The dominance of the United States over space exploration is being massively challenged for the first time since their original contest with the Soviet Union back in the 1960s. And this new contender is not here to mess around. They are making aggressive plans and they are turning those words into actions and accomplishments, a key point that NASA has struggled with for a long time now. China has a much better chance of winning the space race than most Americans realize, and this is something that we need to be talking about. This is the space race. Let's start with the big one, the race to the moon. More specifically, this is a competition to see who can establish a permanent base at the lunar south pole which is an area believed to be flush with critical resources, such as water, that would support a long-term human presence on the moon. In one corner, we have the Artemis program. This is a joint effort between the United States, Canada, Japan, and Europe, among many other smaller agencies who have signed on to the Artemis Accords, the newest of which being India, which is very important to note because just recently, we watched India successfully land the first robotic lander at the lunar south pole. So this is a powerful coalition of nations, though let's not pretend that this isn't an American first operation. The US wrote the Artemis Accords and the entire program was set into motion by President Trump in 2017. I somehow doubt that he did much consultation with international partners before making that decision. Trump was also responsible for formally establishing the United States Space Force, which is still a silly name, but is actually something that was very much needed for this new era of space competition. The US military has obviously been involved in the space program from the very beginning, but by creating a dedicated branch focused on outer space activities, it shows the world that this is something the US takes seriously, or at least as serious as you can be taken with a name like Space Force. I mean, imagine if we had called the Navy Water Force? Anyway, if there's anything that can be said about Trump and his vice president, Mike Pence, it's that they understood the consequences of being surpassed by China in the space race. The US had become a sleeping hare while the Chinese remained a fast approaching tortoise. Now, I wanna go back to a quote from Mike Pence that was said in March 2019, because it's as true now as it was back then. Make no mistake about it, we are in a space race today, just as we were in the 1960s, and the stakes are even higher. What we need now is urgency. The United States must remain first in space in this century as in the last, not just to propel our economy and secure our nation, but above all, because the rules and values of space, like every great frontier, will be written by those who have the courage to get there first and the commitment to stay. That sense of urgency expressed by Pence was spurred on by China's robotic moon landing in January 2019. Chang'e 4, which marked the first ever soft landing on the far side of the moon. China had shown the world that they could do something in outer space that no one else had done before. And while landing a robot on the moon in the 21st century might not sound like such a massive accomplishment, keep in mind that in the time since Chang'e 4, we've seen India, Japan, and now even Russia attempt to land their own robotic missions and fail to even touch down successfully on the moon. Every attempt resulted in a crash landing and destruction of the payload until just last week when India succeeded on their second attempt. And to drive home the fact that this was no fluke, China went on to succeed with Chang'e 5 in November 2020. This was a complex mission involving an orbiter, lander, rover, and a sample return vehicle that launched moon rock into space and transported it back to Earth. That was the first time people had returned a sample from the moon since the mid-1970s, and what we've seen so far from the Chinese is just the tip of their lunar iceberg. This is a plan that China has been working on since 2004, a three-phase lunar expansion program, and the current robotic missions are only phase one. We are less than a year away from the launch of Chang'e 6, which will be China's second excursion to the far side of the moon, and more significantly, this mission will attempt the first ever sample return from the moon's far side. They are probably not going to discover something unknown over there, the only difference between the two halves of the moon is that one side is always visible from the earth, and the other side is never visible from the earth. Don't ask why, it's kind of complicated. But the point is, that yet again, China is doing something that no one else has done before, 
and they're making damn sure that everyone, especially the United States, can see them do it. This will be followed up by Chang'e 7 in 2026, China's most ambitious lunar mission, consisting of an orbiter, lander, rover, and hopping spacecraft designed to seek out water ice in permanently shadowed areas of the Shackleton Crater at the lunar south pole. The Chang'e 8 will launch two years after that in 2028 and land nearby Chang'e 7, carrying a robot designed to test 3D printing bricks from Lunar Regolith. This marks the end of China's Phase 1 lunar expansion. Phase 2 is where stuff gets real. In the year 2029, China is going to land their first crew of Taikonauts on the moon. And I say that this is something China is going to do and not something they are planning to do because 2029 will mark the 80th anniversary for the People's Republic of China, and there is no doubt that the Chinese Communist Party will take this opportunity to make a colossal move on the global stage. And like we've said before, this is something that China has already planned out. There are three main components to a successful human landing on the moon. A heavy lift rocket, a crew vehicle, and a lunar lander. We already know what these components are going to be in the context of the Artemis program, the SLS, the Orion, and the Starship. China's heavy lift rocket of choice will be their upcoming Long March 10. This vehicle is currently under development with a scheduled test flight for 2027. Unlike their much more ambitious and experimental Long March 9 concept, the Long March 10 leverages existing Chinese rocket technology, namely their YF-100 kerosene engine, and this should allow for the rocket to move rapidly from the development phase to active service. Long March 10 will be a 90 meter tall, three-stage rocket that utilizes two liquid-fueled side boosters in addition to a center core booster, each of them fitted with seven of the YF-100 engines. So, Long March 10 is going to look and function very similar to a SpaceX Falcon Heavy with the capability to deliver 27 metric tons to lunar orbit. China also has a plan to make the three booster cores reusable by having them complete a propulsive landing. Again, very similar to a Falcon Heavy, except instead of landing legs, China wants to catch the booster with a system of tightrope-like wire tethers. The next key component is known as the NGCS, which stands for Next Generation Crewed Spacecraft. And this is essentially a Chinese equivalent of NASA's Orion spacecraft that is being used for the Artemis missions. The capsule supports a three-person crew and includes a service module for power and propulsion, while this vehicle is still in development, China began full-scale prototype testing as early as 2016. The third component is China's lunar lander. This will allow two astronauts to reach the surface of the moon and then return to orbit again. This vehicle is also under development. Now, because the Long March 10 will only be rated for 27 tons to lunar orbit, the execution of this plan will require two separate rocket launches one Long March 10 to send the crewed spacecraft and a second Long March 10 to deliver the lunar lander. Then the two vehicles will rendezvous and dock in lunar orbit for crew transfer. It's a pretty similar outline to the Artemis 3 mission profile. Much like the old Apollo missions, the first Chinese stay on the moon will be relatively short, just around six to eight hours of exploration, sample collection, and conducting experiments this will include the use of an electric lunar rover that will have 10 kilometers of driving range. Now, I know what you might be thinking. This China thing isn't really that big of a deal because NASA is going to be landing people on the moon by 2025, and they'll have a full Artemis moon base in progress by the time China even arrives. Will they though? I don't think there is any well-informed person in the space community who honestly believes that we are landing on the moon in 2025. The signs of progress are just not there right now. SLS and Orion have flown one test mission, which was very successful. That's good. The SpaceX Starship, which is being counted on as our human landing system, has also made one test flight, which was not successful. That's bad. Obviously, there's nothing easy about making a lunar-capable super heavy lift rocket, but if you were to put them on a spectrum, SLS would be right around moderate difficulty level, while Starship is maxed out, insanity levels of difficult. Plus, we've already seen the first NASA officials winding up to throw SpaceX under the bus for delaying the Artemis 3 landing. NASA Associate Administrator Jim Free recently hinted that Artemis 3 may have to go ahead without a moon landing. 
Free said that NASA might change the mission parameters to something more viable. And NASA has grounds to be worried. SpaceX needs to figure out how to get Starship into orbit, which is going to be very difficult, but they can probably do it. Then they need to figure out how to get the gigantic upper stage back down from space in one piece and stick the propulsive landing. That's going to require the equivalent of a space miracle. Then, SpaceX needs to figure out their orbital gas station and tanker ship system. Then they need to build a variation of the Starship that can land on the moon and keep two people alive there for five days. Then they need to get that Starship all the way to the moon and land on it. And then they need to do that flawlessly enough that NASA decides it is safe to try again with people on board. Now, I'm not saying that that can't all be done in two years, but it does sound fairly preposterous. So there is a non-zero chance that the Chinese will beat NASA to the first crewed moon landing of the 21st century. And in any sensible world, that shouldn't actually matter. We as human beings should just be stoked that any person landed on the moon. That is amazing. But the current environment of global politics is not even the least bit sensible, and it's going to be pretty bad for us as Western people if China manages to win the biggest pissing contest of the 21st century. But the thing about all of this is that landing people on the moon one time does not actually matter. It's cool and stuff, but walking on the moon is a relatively inconsequential flex. Just look at Apollo. The Americans walked on the moon a few times and then they stopped, and then everything went right back to the way it was before. The US failed to establish a lasting presence on the moon, but China will not make the same mistake. That's why they've already mapped out a detailed plan for their own International Lunar Research Station, also known as a moon base. Announced in 2021, the ILRS will begin construction in the 2030s and will be a fully autonomous robotic installation at the Lunar South Pole. So the Chinese are going to touch ground on the moon in 2029 just to show the world that they can, and then they're going to spend the next decade using robotic missions to stake their own permanent claim. Initially, this moon base was supposed to be a joint venture between China and Russia, but the whole Russia involvement slowly started to fade away as the war in Ukraine intensified, and now in August 2023, as the Russians attempted to prove their worth by landing on the moon again for the first time in 50 years, they actually ended up highlighting just how far their space agency has fallen with the catastrophic failure of their Luna 25 rover. So the idea that the Russians would play a major supporting role in the construction of ILRS seems unlikely at this point. China has already far surpassed any capability that the Russian or Soviet space program ever had even at their peak. In a recent update to their plan for the International Lunar Research Station initiative, China's space agency announced that they are actively recruiting new member countries to join in their future plans to colonize the moon. So instead of a partnership between two great powers, the ILRS concept is now expanded to include Pakistan, the United Arab Emirates, and the Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation, which includes Turkey, Mongolia, Thailand, Peru, Iran, and Bangladesh. China claims that there are an additional 10 countries and organizations currently in negotiation to join the initiative among them being Malaysia and Venezuela. The ILRS will be completed over the course of five missions in the 2030s, and this is going to require the development of China's Long March 9 rocket, essentially their own equivalent of the Starship Super Heavy. Long March 9 was first imagined a decade ago as a conventional Super Heavy lift rocket, basically just a much bigger version of the current Long March 5, but then China saw what SpaceX had done with the Starship and they immediately pivoted Long March 9 to follow the same formula. The new Long March 9 comes in two varieties, a three-stage rocket optimized for deep space exploration and a two-stage heavy lifter to low Earth orbit. Stage 1 consists of a 9-meter diameter booster with 30 methane-fueled engines, each delivering 200 tons thrust, so that's not quite as much power as a Starship, but it's pretty damn close. The main difference here is that instead of one gigantic upper stage like Starship, Long March 9 will have a second stage with two of the methane engines to send the payload into orbital velocity, and then the third stage will have a vacuum-optimized hydrogen engine to achieve the translunar injection orbit. So overall, Long March 9 will be less powerful than Starship, but also much lighter. 
it won't have the same mass to orbit capability, but Long March 9 will not require orbital refilling to reach the moon. There are five ILRS landings scheduled between 2031 and 2035, each deploying a component of the future moon base. ILRS-1 establishes the command center with basic energy and telecommunications facilities. Mission 2 brings lunar research and exploration facilities. Mission 3 is all about in-situ resource utilization technology. Mission 4 puts all of that into use with a robotic exploration and experiment mission complete with a distributed sample collection and return. And then Mission 5 will establish lunar-based astronomy and Earth observation capabilities. When this is all said and done, the Chinese will have one hell of a moon base for themselves and their growing host of international partners to begin advanced human operations on the moon. And at the same time, NASA is proposing to do something with their Artemis program. This is the worrying point. Aside from the construction of their orbital gateway station, which is awesome, NASA hasn't really provided the same level of detail on just how they are going to go about creating their own moon base. And as we've seen, any time NASA does try and make a plan, it almost immediately falls apart and gets delayed, modified, and confused. And this is kind of the way that NASA has always been. The US tendency to ping pong back and forth between Democratic and Republican governments means that the people in charge are never on the same page for more than eight years at a time. And even within those election cycles, priorities can change drastically from year to year. So here's the thing. I think most of us can agree that authoritarian dictatorships are bad. Like in general, it's a bad way to run a country and govern people, at least in my opinion. But when it comes to making very complex and expensive long-term plans like colonizing the moon and actually following through with them, we've got to admit that an authoritarian model like the Chinese Communist Party does have a clear advantage in this area. So there is a very real chance that the Chinese will win this new space race in this decade, and we've got to, at the very least, start preparing ourselves for whatever the consequences of that power shift might be. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real, and subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.